here. <laughs> wow, what she said. <laughs> Thank you, Christy, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you all so much for being here. You do look so beautiful. Wow, <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful evening. I'm just so excited, I just can't hide it. <laughs> well, tonight we are celebrating 20 years of Out and Equal. We all know it takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a tribe to raise an organization. There are so many people here tonight who have contributed to this ongoing success of Out and Equal over the years. But I do have to just acknowledge uh, my mentors and advisors of the past 20 years, Janie Spar, Cynthia Wenton Henry, Christy Hardwick, and of course my biggest supporter, my wife, Cynthia Martin. Thank you. <laughs> Tonight we're celebrating 20 years of building community, telling our stories, and making a difference, one cubicle and one company and one country at a time. But as I look around at all of you, I see incredible champions of our community. I see leaders from multinational companies and federal agencies. I see community builders and activists and politicians. I see artists and change makers. I see people committed to equality and freedom. Tonight, Out and Equal is honoring 10 champions that have taken up the banner of equality at their companies, creating Out and Equal workplaces around the world. And tonight, we're celebrating the real life San Francisco activists portrayed in the powerful ABC series, When We Rise. So we have Roma, Dion, Cecilia, Cleve, and Ken. So thank you all for being here, and thank you for your incredible stories. Well, I'm, I'm sure, as, as Kate just said, that you've heard <laughs> that in the next few months I'll be transitioning from my role as CEO of Out and Equal to an ambassador role. It's both exciting and really kind of hard and sad, but um, I know it's the right time. You should know that a couple of weeks ago, uh, Cynthia and I were driving uh, coming back from an event, driving down the highway, and before you knew it, we had stopped uh, in this big lot, and we were looking at RVs. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's true. I, <laughs> I can't deny it. So one of these days, if you're looking at your door, and uh, you, <laughs> you see us drinking coffee on your lawn, <laughs> do not be alarmed. Uh, but if you could just come out and join us and maybe bring the Wi-Fi password with you. <laughs> kind of show us the controls on your hot tub, that'd be really helpful. But. I think we all know that we still have work to do, and together we will write the next chapter for our Out and Equal and for this incredible movement of equality. So seeing you all here makes me feel more confident than ever in the future of LGBT workplace equality. To be lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender in 2017 is to stand amidst the messy middle pages of our movement's history. We look behind us to acknowledge, acknowledge just how incredibly far we've come. We look around us to see how imperfect progress can be. And we look forward to imagine an even greater future of living freely, openly, and without fear. We can now be married in 24 countries around the world. That's right. We celebrate that every single day. Yet, in 76 countries, we can still be arrested, imprisoned, or even killed simply because of who we are and who we love. And in the United States, we can still be fired in 28 states for showing our wedding picture at the office. So this juxtaposition of progress and backlash, of momentum and resistance, is the landscape of our lives at this time in history. 
Today, we're living in a country where the most vulnerable in our community are at risk of lo losing basic human rights. And it's just so jarring to go from such a supportive White House administration to this volatile political climate and a place where we're seeing countless anti-LGBT religious exemption laws being introduced in states all over the country. I talk to people who are just beginning to feel comfortable coming out in their company or their federal agency, and they're asking me if they should go back into the closet. But we know that we can't go back and that we must all stand together. We will stay strong and we will rise. <laughs> One thing I know to be true about our community, when we face discrimination, when we are bullied or belittled, we gather the strength, the resourcefulness, and the love of our community. And then we are unstoppable. Like all journeys, the journey of Out and Equal began with a first step. In our case, it was the step I took out of the closet and into my life as an out and proud lesbian. I came out to myself when I, was in a, when, when I was in seminary studying to be a Presbyterian minister, and it was there that I found myself at a crossroads. I could follow my dream of becoming a minister only if I lied about who I was. And I could follow my heart only if I was willing to give up my dream. No one should be forced to make that choice. I remember making that very difficult decision to finally come out, which I knew would mean essentially getting kicked out of the ordination process. And then once I felt the excitement about coming out, but then I felt this overwhelming anxiety of, well, now what? I just spent four years of my life getting a not very useful Master's of Divinity degree. <laughs> and trying to picture what I was going to do with my life. Well, during that time, a friend of mine asked me, Celise, if you could do anything in the world, what would it be? And without even thinking about it for a second, I just blurted out, I said, I want to, I want to lead a national LGBT nonprofit organization. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> I had no idea there was so much power in that statement. In retrospect, I, I guess I should have said I'd like to travel the world on a yacht. <laughs> but it, yeah, even as I was saying those words, I want to run a national LGBT organization, I remember thinking, I have no idea how to do that. Where would I even start? I knew nothing about running a nonprofit and even less about starting one. But I did know how to bring people together. And I had a passion for building community and that I didn't want anyone else to ever have to choose between the career they loved and the person they loved. So 20 years ago, I started with a, a big dream, a borrowed desk from our good friends at United Way, a lot of volunteers and no money. 20 years ago, there were no employment protections for LGBT people. But instead of focusing on the laws that I didn't feel I could change, I started talking to companies one by one about the importance of LGBT policies and guiding them toward making their workplaces more welcoming. And I had more than just a dream and a story. I also had the power of lesbian networking. <laughs> exactly. Before, before there was social media, there was the LGBT community, and we knew better than anyone how to make stuff happen and get things done. Yes, there really is a gay mafia. <laughs> but I didn't know personally how to get domestic partner benefits passed, but I knew people who did. I had never started an employee resource group, but I had friends all over the country that had. One of the earliest lessons I learned starting out in Equal was that I didn't need to have all the answers, I just needed the community. And so through the power of asking, the generosity of volunteers, and the sheer audacity to believe we could do it, we hosted our first Out in Equal Summit uh, in Atlanta, and I was so excited that 200 people showed up. 
to forge lifelong bonds of friendship and solidarity. It was really an amazing summit, um, but that's not to say there weren't a few setbacks. The AV company showed up and uh, they were literally setting up for the big gala that night. And once they learned that it was an LGBT event, they scanned the room, looked around, put down their lights and their equipment, and they left the building. So what do you do? We soldiered on, and the first summit was a powerful success. Of course, last fall, we hosted the Out and Equal Summit with 4,200 people from 35 countries around the world. So <laughs> kind of grew up. But as I think about these past uh, 20 years and recall how we made all this happen, I think about you. I think about your stories. Our stories are so powerful, so important, and it's our stories that really are changing the world. Ken Jansen works at J.P. Morgan in London, and after attending an Out and Equal Executive Forum, go Ken. Uh, he worked with us to plan an amazing LGBT forum in Sao Paulo last fall with the CEO of J.P. Morgan Brazil and other senior leaders. He started J.P. Morgan's first LGBT employee group in India, and Ken has been instrumental in supporting their LGBT employees and the broader LGBT community in Hong Kong. A few months ago, I was invited to speak at a company in my home state of Oklahoma. <laughs> While I was there, I met a transgender woman who had been in the military for 30 years before retiring and then transitioning. She said that so many people came up to her and told her how brave she was for transitioning, and she always tells them, no, this is easy. The hard part the part that I had to be brave for was getting up every morning for 30 years and pretending to be a man. This is easy. My good friend George Calagridis started his career at Disney as a busboy and is now the president of Walt Disney World. Go, George. Several years ago, uh, several years ago, someone from a conservative right-wing group went online and posted the fact that George was gay and gave directions on how to get past security and into his office. Well, when the president of the company came to George to talk about this, share that news, George said, in retrospect, he should have been a little more concerned about his personal safety, uh, but his first thought was that he would be fired. But before he could respond, the president said very emphatically, George, we are with you 100%. And since then, George's career, of course, has only gotten stronger, uh, proving that we are most successful when we are most authentic. In the unenlightened days of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Major General Tammy Smith wanted to speak out and make her voice heard. So she took up the only option available to her at the time. Every week for years, she wrote anonymous postcards to legislators. Years later, a Republican senator was being interviewed on TV about shifting her stance on LGBT people in the military. And when asked why she had changed her mind, she held up the postcard that Tammy had sent her years earlier. She shared that when she heard that we were asking someone to lie about who they are, while well, they were willing to sacrifice their life for our country, she couldn't stand by any longer. One postcard from one person changed the course of thousands of LGBT lives in our entire country's national security. As Tammy shared her story with me, she also shared the photos she took 
the day that she met with Senator Susan Collins from Maine, who still had the postcard on her wall all these years later. Tammy would have loved to be with us tonight, but she's on assignment on the other side of the world, still protecting our country, but finally is an out, proud, lesbian major general. <laughs> Our stories are so powerful. Everyone in this room knows that. You've been telling your stories and inspiring others to do so, and together we are changing the world. I'm so proud of our accomplishments in About and Equal these past 20 years. When I look out across this room, I see gorgeous, courageous, caring people, both LGBT and allies, who are committed to building a world where we are all welcome, invited, and able to thrive. So as I move from my role as founder and CEO into an advisory role for Out and Equal, I'm confident that our future is secure and our big dreams are in safe hands. One of the most important things baked into the DNA of Out and Equal has always been and will always be the message that we are not alone that we're all in this together. Together, we will ensure that everyone around the world is truly out and equal. And together, we will rise. Thank you.